And thank you so much for being, being here this afternoon. And I um, really want to let you know that I'm grateful that you are taking your time to support this uh, Provost Spotlight um, initiative. The Spotlight series is a forum designed to highlight the accomplishments of our faculty. The question and answer format of this program actually allows us to learn about the scholarship, motivation, challenges, background, and, and also the, the personal interests of some of our distinguished faculty members. I'm pleased to honor Dr. Lepo, Lepo Sava Vukovic, a professor of physics and eminent scholar, and also Dr. Dr. Emilia um, Solesik, who is an associate a professor of uh, biological sciences. In addition to learning about their personal journey, we will explore how their educational and international backgrounds have shaped their views and perspective and their accomplishments as women in the sciences. The spotlight is hosted by Dr. Annette Finley and Cross White, who is the director of, for the Center of, for Faculty Development and also a professor of history. Before we begin our program, I would like to take a minute here to share a few words about our distinguished faculty. First, Dr. Vukovic is a professor of, of physics and eminent scholar. She obtained her PhD in physics from Belgrade uh, University. Prior to, uh, to joining Odomino University in 1993, she held the positions in the Institute of Physics at the Belgrade University and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at New York University. She was, she was elected as a fellow in the American Physical Society in 2002. At the beginning of her career, she focused her research on fundamental atomic physics and processes involving scattering of of electrons from atoms, including measurements of absolute uh, di differential cross sessions. You can tell that I know exactly what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> um, such the correlations are considered the, the benchmark for the direct the comparison of many body quantum calculations with experiments. At Odomino University, she continued to develop new techniques to investigate problems of fundamental interest in atomic physics, gas, discharge, and plasma physics. She's conducting the experiment at high, high pressure where plasma is partially ionized. In this, uh, this environment, it is possible to simulate real life uh, phenomena combining knowledge of both plasma and atomic physics. She has published over 90 papers, 10 books or book chapters, and over 25 uh, reports. She is a renowned teacher and advisor at ODU. In 2008, she won the Doctoral Mentor Award, and again in 2012, she won the Distinguished Faculty Award in Research from the College of Sciences. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Dr. Emilia Amoliesek, who is a professor in the biology department here at Old Dominion University. Um, she received her master's degree in pharmaceutical sciences from the Medical School of Wroclaw in Poland and PhD in Virology from the Hartsfield Institute of Immunology and Experimental Therapy from Polish Academy of Sciences. She continued her education as a postdoctoral fellow at the Memorial Catherine Cancer Center. Subsequently, she joined the section of Neuropathology Department of so of surgery at Yale University School of Medicine as a Commonwealth 
Fellow, where she studied the role of transformation in Crossfield Jacob disease. She later held positions at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston and the Felt Institute of Cancer Center and Molecular, Molecular Biology in the path of the Temple uh, University School of Medicine. She took up the position here at Odomini University in 2007. Her area of research is the investigation of immuno, the pathogenesis of multiple uh, sclerosis. She has published over 50 peer-reviewed journals, articles, and, and book chapters, and has secured over $8.5 million in research and training grant. She has taught both undergraduate the graduate medical students, dental and, and pharmacy students here at Odomi University. She teaches a virology and histology to undergraduate and graduate students. Now I would like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Annette Finley Crosswide, who will begin the conversation with, with our new honorees. Please join me to welcome our two distinguished faculty members. Thank you, Provost Ago. Let me begin today <clears throat> by explaining a little bit about this format. It's very relaxed, it's very comfortable, and hopefully you'll have a nice hour here to talk with our distinguished faculty members. The Provost Spotlight is based loosely on James Lipton's Inside the Actor's Studio, which is a television show that's been running since 1994. It was a concept developed by the late actor Paul Newman, and it kind of morphed into a seminar that Pace University offers to their um, actor studio, uh, to their drama students in their actor studio drama school. And so the format is that I ask questions and they answer them. And because it's Women's History Month, we wanted to highlight especially the accomplishments of distinguished women faculty. So without further ado, I'm going to begin talking to Dr. Vuskovic and Dr. Olesak, and we will begin. Thank you. So for our first question here, many of your colleagues are in the audience, and they know well what you do in terms of your scholarly work. But for the rest of us, for those of us who aren't scientists particularly, could you take a few minutes to discuss your research and explain the most significant work that you've done? So who would like to begin first? Okay, okay. I have been selected All to right. go talk first. Um, well, I was always interested in viruses, um, and in particular, uh, in viruses which can induce demyelinating inflammatory disease. For some of you who do not know what myelin is, it's a layer which surrounds axon of neurons in our brain and is extremely important to process information and uh, transduction. Now, it just happens that um, we know by now that multiple sclerosis is associated with certain viruses, but not all viruses. So there is not one multiple sclerosis virus, but many of them. And on top of everything, it happens to be multiple sclerosis, that is um, autoimmune disease. So let me just explain very briefly what we think is happening during viral infection. Very likely, children are getting infected with viruses or perhaps even immunized with different vaccine. Um, of course, immune response cleared this viral infection, which is expected for immune system to do. However, in certain cases, and this is what happened with patients with multiple sclerosis, the same immune response which was responsible for clearance of the virus, unfortunately cross-react, the term is actually molecular mimicry, cross-react um, with host antigen, which happened to be actually myelin. So whole disease is actually cross-reactivity between viral protein and myelin. Now, I understand that we have about 45 minutes to 
answer all other questions, and I think that um, uh, Dr. Vuskovic needs to discuss much more important things about. Uh, so well, I will stop at that. Before she begins, though, I have to ask, you said micro-mimicking? Is that? Molecular mimicry. Molecular mimicry. mimicry. We're, We're learning micro... new words here. Okay. It's going to be more difficult, I think. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my story is much simpler. Um, I'm atomic and the plasma physicist. What really we are doing, atom is small, but there are methods to make him big. In other words, to see what's going on. And specifically, it was very important to see how atom behaves when collides with a free electron or when it's exposed to external electric field, okay? And uh, by doing that, you measure different properties, different quantities. At the end, you get one number that is benchmarked for everything else. What is everything else? Someone who likes to calculate, you can produce very limited experimental data. And if someone likes to calculate, has something to relay on. To, to. However, the uh, most exciting part is, since I'm supposed to answer that as well, is the fact that atoms sometimes is very complicated if it has many electrons around. So uh, I was witness and participated in the work that people making decision what, how to approach certain kind of um, laser, if you like, making the laser, making inverse population, they waited to get our results to see is it possible to make uh, inverse population. That will be too long to continue, but just a few words about uh, plasma part. Uh, plasma, for people who are not in the field, is not plasma from the blood. It's a really ionized state of matter. It means all atoms and molecules that we see, we breathe, if you like, uh, are ionized. You take away one electron, rest of it is atom. From outside is neutral, but inside is not. So uh, that's plasma. But it, once you produce this at high level, high level means close to atmospheric level, atmospheric pressure, below atmospheric still. In that case, you have combination of all possible species, neutral, excited, and on, ionized, and on and on. So why this is important region? That's where it's, uh, why it's worth it to study. Because all applications are in that range, or most of them. I'm not talking about energy source. So that's why we are focused on that. So many real life experiences, real life needs, you can produce in the lab, right? And, and then study and see how. Just to give you an example, we had several experiments. People usually like this example. That's what I give you. Uh, that we simulated in the lab Martian atmosphere. What, whatever is known was going on at planet Mars, we simulated in our lab. And then we studied and so is it possible to get oxygen out of CO2? Then we, we studied continuing after that to see is it possible to harvest, that's not my term, that's not the term, uh, harvest the energy from the plasma that is produced when the particle is, or space shuttle is, or shuttle, any shuttle, is entering the, the atmosphere of Mars and this kind of story. So that's the thing what we are doing, what I'm doing, where I'm involved. So now, if I have to say what is the most important, well, I, there are a lot, it's, what is important, history will say. I cannot speak what is now. But I believe that current work also will be recognized as much as work several decades back. So I guess what you're saying is we can't go to Mars without the work that you're doing. Right? Oh, well, of course, <laughs> especially me, right, right. Unfortunately, as you know, funds have shifted left and right, and Mars is not on the top of NASA. But anyhow, that's one simple example. Okay. Thank you, thank you. All right. What drew you to, to the study of sciences? Why don't we go this way yeah. this time? Okay. Well, that is easy, for me at least. One thing that I liked from before I started to go to primary school and all the way to, 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 to the high school, the most challenging aspect of my studying was mathematics. I really liked to, 
to work. But always was stimulating to solve the problem. So I guess that's why I had to solve so many problems in my life, because I like it, it looks like. So anyhow, uh, once I approached the time to decide what should I study, I did not know what to do. I did not like, okay. I had one serious conversation with my father. He asked me, what should I do? And I said, I don't know, I just like something. And he said, why, why not to take something practical? For example, you can be a dentist. And uh, I explained that this is not a field for me at all, under any circumstances. And, and uh, he, he said, okay, you do what you want, but you just have to be good in it. And then you will survive. Okay, fine. But still, I don't know what. Through family connections, I got to, to be advised by the person who was, for me, at the time that Jesus Christ came to help me. That was the, that was the Professor Savage, who was working, the number one professor at the time. Uh, he was working with the daughter of Marianne Pierre Curie. That was enough for me to start with. Then uh, he was director of the Nuclear Institute and on and on. And once it was explained to him that I like mathematics, but I like something where mathematics is important, but not mathematics per se, uh, he suggested that I should study physical chemistry. And I have mathematics in the first year, second year, third year, ta ta ta. And I was very happy, of course, I signed for that. After the first year, I found out that there is no mathematics anymore. It turns out that mathematics is not required in the second and third year. But since tuition was free, I was able, it did not exist at all, so I was able to sign mathematics in the second year and third year. And I, and I finished, of course, everything what was needed for physical chemistry. But what I was doing, I was taking mathematics with physicists. And at the end of the day, I got a diploma in physical chemistry, and then I continued with, uh, with physics for Master of Science and for PhD degree. That's where I am. So I did not know what should I do, what should I do but that's how I become a scientist. Okay, and Amelia? Um, well, in contrast to Annette and uh, Dr. Vuskovic, I'm not exactly sure how I'm supposed to answer this question. Um, why I like sciences. I know that I like viruses. I don't know why I got interested in this, perhaps. When I applied to graduate school, it was still in Poland. It just happened that the laboratory I selected was run by a distinguished scientist, a lady, by the way, Anna Inglot, who later on was a known member of underground solidarity, unfortunately, was even in prison. But anyway, she was probably the best virologist, and she was MD, PhD. Some of her uh, training was in the United States. She spent a couple of years in an arbor, and somehow she was able to talk about viruses in such an exciting way that I guess I selected my thesis based on viruses. And once you study viruses, you learn that they are RNA viruses, DNA viruses. You don't know if they are alive or they are not alive. They are very mysterious, I would <coughs> say. And continuing this, like I obtained my PhD in virology. And I guess I continue working on viruses, but, but with this perhaps um, different angle how they can induced uh, demyelination in brain. This is what sounds good. Sounds good. All right, this is my favorite question. Dr. Vuskovic is from Belgrade. Dr. Olasak is from Vaslav. Close enough. So I want to know what it was like to be a woman to be a woman in the sciences in Eastern Europe at this time, in Poland under the Soviet Union, the control of the Soviet Union, former Yugoslavia with Tito. I mean, what was it like to be a woman in the sciences in those environments? Should I start? OK. So I have to answer the first question. I'm not from Eastern Europe, not from Western Europe. I'm just from Europe. I'm from Yugoslavia. Unfortunately, that does not exist anymore. So I'm from Serbia now. 
even I was born and raised in Yugoslavia. So main difference uh, between people in the Eastern Bloc and Yugoslavia is that every member in Yugoslavia was able to get a passport. Everybody was traveling in and out. It was open from that standpoint. Uh, once I start myself to go out from the country to the conferences, uh, people from West would call me Eastern scientists. People from, from West Europe called me West, or no, opposite. Mm -hmm. West part Eastern, East part Western. I never understood why so. But I did once I touched the United States, I will tell you later. Uh, so, uh, first, this is a tricky question because uh, there is 50% of females in the undergraduate studies at my time and right now. You have many female uh, young people who become physicists, who are interested in physics. That really is telling me that you have, uh, you have reason to, cho you have possibility to choose. But as you progress with your profession, up and up, you have less and less females, smaller percentage. One has to study a little bit deeper to see why so. Is it because they are less capable, what I don't believe, of course, or it is because that traditional life is such that female part is taking more care about home, children, and the rest of it, and they simply have no energy to do everything. But in any case, to have even an Institute of Physics where I spend my time, uh, most of my time, uh, we have big percentage of females there. And it was never discussion, are you female or male? I was just a physicist, not Eastern Bloc or Western Bloc, or female or male, I was physicist. Mm -hmm. And I was competing with results. And I was accepted as such, first within my surrounding, then within Europe, where I was in touch first, so. Okay, and Emilia? Well, I grew up in Poland, so uh, in comparison to previous, I guess, Yugoslavia, um, I guess it was a Western country. This is the way we've seen it. First, um, I was growing under a repressive system. Um, probably everybody knows about it, um, so it wasn't much fun. Everything was extremely restricted, including passport, so one could not travel. And of course, there was shortage of everything, which affects everybody's life. But going back, what does it really mean uh, to be women scientists? in even those days in Wrocław and the communistic regime, and surprisingly, I have the same impression what Dr. Vuskovic has. That is, I guess, Russians, um, Soviet Russians, um, decided to send to work everybody, this include women. If you ever seen uh, posters of Russian propaganda with all women doing absolutely everything, including working in fields, being physicists, they really mean it. Everybody's supposed to work, which actually turned out for women, and you know, this is probably the only good thing what I can say about this system, but for women, it turned out okay, because it was the same thing. I was not concerned applying for graduate school if it's going to be somebody else, a man, who is better qualified, because Essentially, my grades were sufficient uh, whether I would be admitted or not. And still, we have probably more than 50% of women in the de as department chairs uh, still. And it was the same uh, maybe in the 80s in Poland. So there was a difference regarding, I don't know why, here I believe we still need to fight for it. Well, maybe I can take that opportunity to mix things up a little bit and ask you um, what we had talked about a little bit earlier, and that has to do with, you know, what was your experience like here, coming here and working in the sciences? Can you, uh, can you compare the experiences of women in the sciences with your experiences in Europe versus your experiences here? 
Oh, well, that is, that is the real question. So I came to this country as completely formed scientist, self-confident by all means, completely accepted by all colleagues there. Uh, so I had two experiences. First experience was in Jet Propulsion Lab in California, where I was not teaching. I was just surrounded with my colleagues immediately in the lab, who accepted me very quickly, because when they start to know me, they just see I am who I am, and it was fine. The second part of people that I met there are parents of, of my kids' friends from the school, their parents, so that was just fine. But once I start going to, to conferences here in the United States, I will be very honest, first of all, very few, very few, that was several decades back, three, more than three decades back. So very few are females, number one, but for me surprisingly was that other colleagues sort of did not feel comfortable having me around. Didn't say anything bad, but they just looked through me rather than at me. So it took, took us some time, several years, maybe decade, if you like. Now I feel comfortable in this country as well. And I have no full answer for that, but one can sp speculate that it was not expected to have females in the field that was mainly uh, field for, for men. <laughs> In the United and States. In the United States. And to be honest, I, I saw many, many times later, I learned, I learned much more when I came to New York University and here to, to, to all dominions since I'm in touch with, with students. And you learn to students much more than you can learn by your, your own experience. And that is, so, so I had as bluntly as that, they told me that I should not take physics course because this is not for a woman. And the, in other words, spirit around to support someone to choose whatever he thinks is very different than in Europe. It's it very is. different. It and one, I will tell you the, the best possible example that I can say. Uh, I had opportunity to have with uh, a famous person from our field, someone from here who is in physics, should know, Rabbi, and he, uh, he was with his wife, it was private communication, a private uh, party, and uh, they asked me something about my profession and so, but perhaps because I'm female, they start explaining that they have two daughters, and of course I become interested and start talking to them, and they explained to me, he explained to me, when I asked about daughters, not what daughters are doing, but to whom they are married. And that was the very high level mind, person that I, and I believe everybody who does know him, respect very, very much. That he means set up is not to speak about female, who she is, even your own daughter, but whom she married. From my standpoint, that was century back opinion. And I, I can continue with other examples, <laughs> but it's enough, I gave the point. Uh, I have a little bit different um, experience. When I came the first time to New York City, and I was, as a postdoctoral fellow, um, um, I was working at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And as everybody knows, uh, in New York City, everybody, including people working in science, are from everywhere. Everybody was from different uh, background, religion, color of skin, language. Nobody ever asked me, what is your accent? Because it would be a boring question. Everybody had an accent, almost. Uh, so I actually didn't notice that there is any difference between treatment of women and men. The same was, by the way, true when I moved later on to Yale University, but maybe because somebody who was my advisor, uh, scientific advisor, that is, uh, was also a woman. So very powerful woman and very well respected at Yale. So again, we had um, perhaps 50% of men and 50% of women working in the laboratory, which was fine. And then we moved to Houston, Texas, and I can tell you Texas is different. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh, I was working in the depart very, very well funded and very good scientific department yeah, at UT Medical School. Um, but um, I was probably one of three or four women, and I was still postdoctoral fellow, out of perhaps 45 males faculty. So honestly, Texans are extremely polite gentlemen. They always kiss my hand, and uh, they did everything. But scientifically, they didn't know what to do with me because I supposed to be at home with my husband, preferably have children, attend charities or whatever good woman supposed to do. So, but I understand that this has changed. It was, we are talking right now about maybe 85, 1985, 86. So I know that UT Medical School is quite different person right now. And in my department, there are right now a lot of physician, scientists, and scientists who are just women. So I guess I just went over there at the wrong period of time. <laughs> and um, I had really great time in Philadelphia, where I moved one more time before coming to ODU. So again, being at medical school, um, I don't think so that uh, I have any complaints. However, coming to, to ODU, I noticed that many students, graduate student and senior uh, student, uh, women, do not feel so comfortable they should be to apply to different, for example, to medical school. They would rather apply to nursing school having very good grades and I found it amazing so I actually tried to explain it and they said no this is what it is expected from me but I, I think that in many cases I was able to actually convince them to apply to medical school and uh, I guess it's always important to have a woman role model either if it is a graduate school or regu regular laboratory, research laboratory, I think it's, it's extremely important. Sounds like ODU is lucky to have you two as mentors. <laughs> My segue now is in, in talking to you about your international experience, your international scholars, and so I would say, you know, uh, Lepsha, I know you explained to me you had the opportunity to come here long before you ever did. So, you know, why did you decide to stay in Belgrade when you had the opportunity to go elsewhere? Oh, well, <laughs> that's okay. So, the time when I was doing my medication, you know, was in Belgrade, and the, the way how it works, you have first to take Master of Science, then to take PhD degree. It's not alternative, it's step at the time. That was the moment when the Institute of Physics was established, uh, and government was very eager to educate a lot of physicists because physics was, was not as strong as mathematics and chemistry before the Second World War in Belgrade, in Yugoslavia, if you like. So, uh, and a statement was open or given to everybody who likes to go out and to do peer degree. Matter of fact, re re arrangement was you have permanent position, you go to place X, do your research, come back and defend, and you are PhD physicist. Honorable, of course. But of course, my story was a little different because I wanted to have family, I wanted to have children, and I decided to, to stay in Belgrade. Am I going to finish PhD degree or not? At that moment was uh, less important for me. So as a result, I got the first child when I was doing Master of Science, second one was doing PhD degree, and all my colleagues went to excellent places, starting from St. Petersburg and Moscow State till Yale, or across entire Europe. And it was good. At the end, we all came together on the same place, excellent, different experience. But I was very, since I did not move from my lab, literally, for the reason I told you. Uh, once we start getting the data and publishing data, when I went first time to conference, everybody knew about the data. And it was really big reward 
really big reward. And the fact is, that is, I can say that my work, together with several other people, because I was among the first people who were employed at that institute. And several days ago, several weeks ago, that institute became uh, first national institute, what should be like here, a uh, national laboratory, if you like, what is really big. So it means several of us, of us who started uh, did good job. So I'm happy about that. But I'm happy that I did finish PhD degree because it was useful to himself to be. And so what got you here? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I, had, I was lucky in my life in the sense that I was invited, always invited, and that was easy. First, my first invitation really was to go to a gentle portion lab. And we were sitting around the table when someone, called, uh, chief of that group, invited me. I didn't know what to say, how to leave kids. It was not clear how should they solve that. But other colleagues sitting, she said, yes, yes, she will go. So he answered for me. So I had no other chance to say yes than but to say yes. So anyhow, I arranged someone to take care about my kids, spent two months in the jet propulsion lab, and that was really, really great thing. Uh, and they suggested that I should come for a year or two, what I did. But I didn't like to stay to the United States because I like to go back to continue building my institute that I started with the group. It was already a very big group. So, but soon or several years later, I got invitation to go to New York University and I came when I was able to come. And that was my first time with university. And that is completely different story, university setting up and, and uh, national laboratory in this country, right? Needless to say that, we, uh, that I was first female physicist in New York University. Yeah. Needless to say that I was first female, student, female uh, professor here at Old Dominion. But luckily, we got Gail just a year later after me. <laughs> and two of us, we did a lot of good things because we understand quickly what really problem is or what could be and so forth. To be honest, uh, I don't think it is plus or minus. Profession has nothing to do with gender, but employing this profession, it really means it is good to have different opinions. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, Dr. Olasek, what got you here to the United States? Well, um, it wasn't really um, such a conscious decision because notwithstanding that, of course, I would love to go um, especially to New York City, because the best laboratory w working on interferon was those days in New York City, in Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. But you know, um, the decision actually has been always at this level been made, unfortunately, by the regime, which was repressive. So it, I could not just apply for passport and to say, well, uh, let me go for one year or two years to study whatever I wanted to study. It just didn't work that way. But again, uh, what Lepsha said, that sometimes one needs to be lucky. So we had beginning of solidarity movement, and we had actually first strikes uh, happened in um, 1979, summertime. And, um, and it looked actually that for the first time, government will not be able to control the situation. So they tried to release uh, this oppressive regulation and I got a passport. I just got a passport. And they let me go to New York City. Now, um, it was kind of a miracle, honestly, especially that about, Ten months later, after I came to New York City, martial law has been imposed, and it was it. Okay, the decision practically has been made for me because now I couldn't come back, or if I would come back, I would be arrested. So, so this is the way it happened. Sounds good. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now to mentor um, female students here, graduate students um, in the sciences in your programs. 
I know that you're both, um, it's been explained to me, really awesome mentors. So tell, tell us a little bit about I, I, that. I think Dr. Dr. Lepsha Buskovic has a better story, especially support she provides well, for her Well, understanding students. what I did, it was obvious that we have to, I have to be that in touch with female students. Because very quickly after I came to, to Old Dominion, I found certain confusion among female part. Without going into details, what kind of confusion, I invited them to my home. Just to, to have a dinner and to see what the problem is. And that's how we started something, what we call women in physics dinner. That's how we call it. But I just like to tell you, almost quarter century this event is going on. And as I pointed out, approximately a year later, Gail joined me and she was completely part of it and, and uh, brought us both together. I think we served, I calculated because of this event, between 150 and 200 dinners. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and um, only, so, only thing that I'm sorry for, that I never took track name of people. I do, we do have pictures, of course. But anyhow, what this gathering is about? Uh, good food, of course. It's usually Friday. We have, we have it uh, now two times per semester. At the beginning, we had three, four times per semester. But it's OK. Two times is reasonable. So uh, who, is pre who is coming? We, first, in, we are inviting the uh, graduate students, female. But we are, in the last decade, we were invited undergraduate students, female, and of course postdoctoral, postdoctoral fellows, and, and uh, sometimes colleagues, female colleagues from other university, or around surrounding university. And what we are just talking, very simple, like we're talking here. But in this simple conversation, I don't know. Have you seen Babist, Babist Feast? Mm -hmm. yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly setting, right? If you serve the good food, people start become relaxed. And then they say what they really feel. And that's exactly what we like to, to find out. And often we found that they simply are not informed. And by better explanation, they feel relaxed and continue to perform better. Or if we sense that there is some, some kind of, uh, of not well handled situation, we try to solve there and behind the scene as well to make the life proper for them. But in the same time, uh, this is the uh, venue where they can meet each other and start to exchange ideas, exchange, uh, speak about problems and help each other even when we are present. We are not present. So that's our famous woman in physics dinner. My, my colleagues sometimes say, when I will make for men, and I do make for, for sometimes, but I have to do it more, but male part of our department is not excluded completely. <laughs> OK, good, good. Anything else? Well, uh, I guess I cannot really uh, add much to it, and definitely. You, do you go to these dinners by every once in a while? No. No, I mean, you go for dinner, but on different yeah. physics. Yeah, yeah. Right, but, right, right. yeah. but you were for said, different occasions. Uh, Lepsha <laughs> has much better stories than me, especially that she cooks so much better than me. So, <laughs> so. this explains a lot. However, I think that um, situation with graduates, women graduate in biology is not so difficult like for women in physics, because still we have about 50% of women who uh, graduate in biology, right? So, um, and of course, in certain departments, situation doesn't look so good, but um, the most important, I believe, is to simply advise students where with their career, where they can go, what departments they're supposed to select, and in particular to select environment where um, women are being appreciated. So um, I guess this is really important part of advising. So Sounds good. Well, if you all have ever watched Inside the Actors Studio, there's something called the famous questionnaire. Um, and that's where James Lipton asked the honorees what are really kind of offbeat questions 
um, but they, they help us get to know the individual a little bit better. So for a few minutes here, I'm going to ask um, some of these offbeat questions. He generally begins by asking an actor, what's your favorite word? And since our scholars here are international scholars, I thought I would ask, what is your favorite word in your native language? And would you tell us that and translate it for us? And then tell us why that's your favorite word in your native language. Dr. Olasek. Okay, well, I guess uh, we are being um, scientists and virologists, so this kind of question is extremely difficult, but I try <laughs> to come up with some kind of answer. So um, I like uh, a word, stokrotka, which happened to be a little flower, but I cannot translate it. Uh, we have some botanists, by the way, in our department, but I cannot provide you with translation. It's just a spring flower, which I happen to like a lot, and I like the way it sounds. So I guess you have to be Polish to appreciate it. And Say it again. Stokrotka. Stokrotka. Oh, here we go. Well, I just invented pozajmi, pozajmiti, because it has a different meaning in, if I translate, it will be to borrow or to lend. Both of these means it has oh. the same name. Oh. And it is very difficult to, to, at the beginning at least for me, to, if I like to get something from you or like to give you something, how to do it. So <laughs> that's why. Better than but did you say you invented this word? No, 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 no I did no. not oh, invent. Okay. I just I invented it. I like it. Okay. I like it okay. like every other word. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, let's see. What's your favorite noise? I hate noise. You hate. <laughs> you know, I hate noise. Too. Um, I like sound of church. Sound of church? Yeah. I really do. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Although I'm not going to church, I have to admit, but I like sound of church. What are you most proud of? Personally or professionally, or both? Well, I guess um, I was able, notwithstanding my situation in Poland, um, I was able to come here and continue to do what I really wanted to do. It means to study virology. So, and I guess as long as I can do it and I can continue doing it, I will be a happy person. So there is not any particular discovery uh, which I made so far, but I may before I retire. So, but it's just pure fun to be able to do what one wants to do. Absolutely. Well, in my case, that is quite clear. From private point of view, I'm most proud of my six grandchildren. <laughs> okay, but from professional point of view, I'm really proud of all PhD degree physicists that graduated under my control. Because I see them being well professionally situated and being happy members of the, not frustrated members as a physicist, but happy physicist. That's what I wanted always to have. So your scholarly so, children as well. Yes, my right? scholarly children. Is Sounds right. good. Yeah. All right, one last question, and that is, if you could go back in time and give advice to your younger self at the age of 20, what would you say to the 20-year-old Lepsha Luskovich and the 20-year-old Amelia Olasek? Lepsha? Well, I would certainly say, tell to myself, please think about yourself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I did not do it well. But in the same time, I was healthy, and that helped balance my Missing, missing of the, of the uh, effort to, to think about myself was balanced by the good health. What would you I, guess, I guess I would just stick to the same question I had at the very beginning, and I would follow exactly the same what I wanted to do. 
this is my answer. Okay, so you would tell yourself to stay with it, yes. right? Sounds yes. good. Well, thank you so much for talking to us this afternoon. At this point in the um, event, we usually raise the lights and, and turn it over to the audience and ask the audience to ask our honorees some questions here today before we leave for the reception. Um, are there any questions out there? I guess we explained it ourselves can be so about well. Virology. Yeah. <laughs> Physics, virology, anything else? Any questions? All right, okay. I have a very silly question. Have you ever seen the movie Ghostbusters? What do you think of the science that happened? Have you seen the movie Ghostbusters? I wasn't going to ask it, but no one was asking. <laughs> Have you seen Ghostbusters? No, I did not. Okay, so they don't know the science. <laughs> well, I have a question. The, the thing that um, you think of your questions. There you are. All right. What's your question? Oh, I was going to ask, uh, what, do you, what do you think about the TV in the United States and how, how that may have impacted our culture, especially compared to Europe? Uh, so she, she asked, what do you think of television in the United States and how that may have impacted our culture versus um, culture good in your question, homeland? Good question, Gail. Very good question. So, so I'm not happy with, with TV here mm -hmm. at all. And uh, to, if I may admit, we have no TV anymore in the house. For two reasons. Uh, it does not cover international story enough. Number one, number two, too many, uh, too many interruptions, mental pressure, stop now, look this, you should buy this, you should buy this. There is no, inf this is not informative. At the moment when I go to, to visit my daughter to England, first thing what I do, I turn on TV and I change the channels, everything possible. And I see information whenever is most important in the world. I see information coming from different point of view, and I can see what's going on. So, so I'm not happy with TV. Sorry. Well, if if it is a question for me too, so uh, I guess um, being in Poland those days, we had of course TV. There were two channels. Both of them were run by government, so you can only imagine what they were. So coming here, everything is better, including commercial, than all this propaganda. But, um, but I think that, you know, here right now, if somebody wa wanted to watch TV, I would stick to PBS cartoons for children. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, in the back there. Yeah, you have, uh, you have seen so In increasing increasing the war on science. The war on war science. science. Do you yeah. see a war on science mm -hmm. in this country? What do you think of that? I've, uh, let me see what you really think. War on science in a sense uh, to be aggressive, to produce data, to compete with your colleagues. asking is like in the 1960s the space program was so yeah, yeah, that's, important that's, and, I and every that's, kid wanted to be an astronaut. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I, I understand. Even my daughter want, wants to be that. So, uh, yeah, I, I understand. I think that general information coming from the media down is going down. First of all, word science I did not hear for quite a time, right? But I, I, I know exactly what was Spirit. That's who. Matter of fact, that's why I came to here, really. Uh, uh, especially being in NASA, you know, uh, in NASA Center, right, where the, everything what is going on was publicized, was exchanged. I just feel like I'm part of it, right? Now, now I don't see that science is important issue at all. 
I even was convinced that, I always believed that natural science is the base for every kind of development, I mean technology development, not every aspect of life, of course. Uh, but I even heard that natural sciences are not so important, that other, other aspects of life are much more important. That we are going, I'm, I'm hearing a, a story that I, I do not understand, or at least I do not agree with. If I may add to it, I'm very puzzled by opinion of people um, about vaccine. We have a really basic problem with vaccination of children. Uh, again, I think that people do not have access, we still go back to facts, but uh, people who advertise or talk about vaccines are not scientists or not physicians, essentially are celebrities. And you cannot sell anything unless you really, you are a very famous person. It doesn't really matter what you know. So it's puzzling that actually scientific facts are not taken into account. Yeah. I don't know what is the reason for it. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Mona? Can you talk about how ODU has changed in the time that you have been? Oh, yes. I, uh, I can comment that uh, there is huge change. I'm here quarter century, almost. Uh, there are a lot of changes for better, uh, especially speaking about the, about the buildings, about options to where to work, where to give the lectures. And so It's a big difference, absolutely big difference. However, in the same time, growing up number of the students and growing up number of faculty members is a little bit disproportional. So uh, from the point of view as a teacher, right, I think that I'm spending more energy than I should. I can use my energy for something better, for audio, if you like, for physics department. For, I'm not saying just to go to do nothing. Uh, that uh, we are going in the direction that has to be a little bit shifted back. But overall, uh, university itself is, uh, looks much better and, and m more enjoyable, more pleasant. All these buildings where we have this kind of performances, for example. <laughs> well, uh, I came here in 2008. Um, so I don't have maybe such a uh, long experience, but I just wanted to tell you, my lab and office, it's still an MGB. So if anybody knows what I'm talking about, it is so. <laughs> and probably I'm going to have some better news maybe in 10 years, or I don't know. But meantime, of course, biology ha has changed enormously. We have 13,000 majors. So we have new faculty, but still 13,000 majors. You have 13,000 majors? 100, I'm sorry. 1,300, thank you, okay. I, I lost my breath there. No, no, I mean the total. No, I mean we love biology and so I should, but maybe not to this level. <laughs> yes. She said, it, it seems in America that students aren't majoring in physics. Um, how can we turn that around? How can we get more physics majors? Well, that is, uh, unfortunately, this is same issue in Europe right now. I was talking at the conferences with colleagues from Germany and from other countries, and they are very concerned that they are getting, that they are getting less and less good physicists coming to the undergrad school. And especially what I learned that I'm mean, just speaking about, talking about, let's conversation that the university where he is professor uh, have certain number of undergrads, and usually these undergrads become graduate students. It is less probable to go farther away from the place where you are. So, how to change it? You know when the physics is good or when it's recognized how important it is, just after the war. And they don't like this reason to, to change the thing around. 
Okay? So to attract people to go to physics, it has to go from the heart. And this very few, small number of people who has so strong desire in the heart to come. And we are doing, uh, not me and my colleagues at the department, but at other departments also, when I'm talking to in this country, we are doing a lot to attract good people, to make them as comfortable as possible, to, to proceed, to learn, to be, to, to carry on knowledge. You cannot stop and continue. That's how it is, right? But I have no clue how to change. They have to see perspective. To, uh, look, you have to look this question from two points. Uh, amount of energy that you put to get PhD degree in physics is much more than to get any undergraduate, for example. I don't like to take and to, to say <laughs> any, any profession at this point, I don't like. And you can be much better paid sometimes than to be PhD physicist, right? And young people just like to get money as soon as possible and continue. There is no, as the very first question was, how much science is recognized. Science is not recognized, in my opinion, as it should be. Or need, not, not science, need for science, need for, for basic facts, for if you like to develop technology. So, and I really, if you have a good idea, please tell us. <laughs> we really, we are, we are actively working on that actively working on that. So, no, no perfect answer, sorry. But we're, we are still working. Yes. I know you both are great scientists, but if you pick one, what do you think the most breakthrough, breakthrough science on your side? What do you pick the most? Breakthrough science, number one. What's the, the biggest breakthrough in, in your field of science right now? Um, I wanted to pick up a woman, so I have to think a little bit, okay? So, uh, who succeeded? But, you know, in area of virology, I just, I think that we have uh, probably 50 Nobel Prize winners, and I would be really, would be difficult for me to pick up one scientist, but perhaps I'm going to say somebody name, it's a man, unfortunately, but his name is Zurhausen. This is a guy who um, described for the first time significance of uh, HPV. It happens to be a virus which is causing cervical cancer. Now for many, many years, nobody believes that this virus can cause cervical cancer, which by the way, kills millions of women. So his studies after he got Nobel Prize in 2008 actually stimulated uh, work on vaccine, and right now we have vaccine against HPV, which in 100%, I mean it, this doesn't happen, 900% prevents cervical cancer, so. Wow. wow. All right, what's the biggest bang in physics? Well, there are a lot of things going on, nothing in my immediate field, but uh, one of the interesting things that I'm hearing, especially having so many um, colleagues from nuclear physics, uh, new, new particles, new understanding what's going on inside of nucleus. Perhaps it's more interesting for fundamental point of view. But from application point of view, well, uh, th there are different stories. One, what should I say, who, who, what should be, where we are, gain, where we are going to where we can gain, if we understand better, is uh, explanation of superconductivity, but real explanation. Mm. So that, that would be my, my take, but their conversation can be very, very different because the Steve Hawkins just passed away, and if we go that ride will be very long. But that would be my short take. Well, let me say this. Um, thank you very much for spending the afternoon with us, our distinguished honorees. I think it's been fascinating talking with you about your experiences in science. We have a reception outside, and so let's continue the conversation. And you just brought up St Stephen Hawking, and we can talk about that too. Okay? So thank you. Yeah.